All Good right. morning, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us uh, for this session. I'm excited to be with you, and I want to thank Terry uh, for inviting me, and certainly we want to thank um, uh, TD for sponsoring our training series, and maybe that's a good way to start. Mr. West, if uh, you would like to have a few words for our audience. Sure. Good morning, everyone. I'm Rob West with TD Bank, and my job at the bank is to work with low to moderate income communities, and I make sure that our community has access to capital, access to banking, when it comes to resources, philanthropy, volunteerism, and helping nonprofits like, um, like the Alliance. So very happy to be here. TD Bank is the ninth largest bank in the United States. We go from Maine to Florida, and we really love small businesses. We're the number one SBA lender. We also like supporting uh, nonprofits because nonprofits are a business. Thank you for having me. Thanks for being here. Thank you. And thanks for reminding us all that nonprofit is a business. Um, not just, <laughs> you know, here to do good work and volunteer, but um, it's a great leeway into our session today. I'm Sandra Bram, and um, when I'm not uh, training on PTO, I am the president and CEO of a large nonprofit headquartered here in Clearwater. We um, also have housing, but we have seven lines of business, um, including child and welfare services, refugee resettlement, workforce development, um, uh, uh, so many other areas, behavioral and mental health, um, residential treatment centers, yes, and um, and Jewish Family Services, where we support um, about 250 Holocaust survivors. Um, I do have a, a, a 20 plus year history in nonprofit leadership, so I'm glad to share just some of the insights uh, with you today as we've uh, also worked to address decreasing uh, resources. So with that, we'll jump right into it. Again, we want to thank TD Charitable Foundation for sponsoring today and Florida Alliance for Community Solutions, who is creating better communities. Thank you, Terry, for being here. So today, uh, just so that uh, we're clear, everyone, um, the training is being recorded and it's a small enough group where I don't think we're going to get on anyone's nerve, but we do want to be respectful of everyone when they're speaking. So if you want to comment, it might be easier to either, you know, have a gesture, raise your hand. That way um, we we will um, recognize you and everyone will be able to hear you. Uh, we ask that you remain on mute while you are not speaking. So that way we don't have feedback in case your dog comes in and starts barking. <laughs> And um, also thank you all for having your video on so we can really engage with one another, even though we're virtual, we can see our faces. And also by participating in this conversation, you agree to follow up information to the Alliance um, that will help us to measure the outcomes from this interaction. And also you will uh, receive uh, access to today's materials. So don't feel like you have to copy um, every slide. Today's agenda, um, we're going to start by just sort of seeing who's in the room that will help me to tailor uh, some of the comments as we get a little uh, more specific throughout the morning. And, um, and then we'll have a, a discussion on funding. Since it's a small enough group, I think we can do that together uh, collectively. So we won't do a breakout there. And we'll have a break. And then we're gonna come back and talk about advocacy. We're gonna do another poll on board engagement, um, which will lead uh, the second half of our discussion. We're gonna think about, talk about revenue. We'll have another break. And these are little short breaks, uh, but it will give you an opportunity to refresh yourself for just a moment. Then we're going to look at innovation and how do we take what we're learning and what we have learned um, since COVID to help us, help us shift into where we need to be. Um, then we're going to also have just a general uh, open discussion with Q&A, and then we'll wrap up. But what I hope also, since it's a small enough group, 
I want to encourage you if you do have comments or questions uh, throughout the presentation, because I think I can keep up with, with it all and the timing. Just raise your hand. Um, I don't expect you to remember something from our funding discussion when we have, you know, open discussion. So let's knock those out as they come up. And I'll promise to keep us on track. Everybody okay with that? Right, let's move on. So um, I'm hopeful today uh, that you will gain tools to better assess um, the cost of your operations and what does it really, really t uh, cost for you to do business. Um, it's an important question because many times we look at our basic expenditures and what comes and goes, but then we don't take into account uh, training costs. We don't take into account um, any, uh, we don't take into account all of our other hidden expenditures like administrative overhead and those things that people volunteer. Um, but if they stop volunteering, what is it going to cost us to replace that service? So we want to try to get a handle on our true operational costs as we explore um, um, <clears throat> resources and innovation. And then we're going to look at innovation, think about how we might begin to do that in your specific uh, examples, in your specific places. And we want to brainstorm uh, relevant opportunities that fit your model. Everybody okay with that? So what we want to do is we want to just start with who's in the room. And Terry's going to help me with a poll. And I will give you a second to get that loaded. What is your annual budget and how many employees do you have? Start with those. You're gonna to need to scroll down. There's four questions. Thank you. Oh, sorry. I have to <laughs> scroll down. <laughs> Everybody has to scroll down. Everybody oh, okay. has to scroll down. So I hit it too fast. Can we redo? Yes. yes. You should be able to. Trying to figure out where is it though. Yeah, I can't find it now. You want to okay. just reset that poll? I'm going to gonna, I'm gonna end the poll. Redo. And I'm going to relaunch. Thank you. There we go. So we have four questions. There's what four questions. So question? there should you should have a little scroll bar on the right. How many employees do you have? How many years has your organization been in existence? And since COVID, my organization has grown, stayed the same, or shrank. So once you answer those four questions, please hit submit. And Terry will let me know when we're all done. I think that's everybody. Three, no, not everybody's done. I've got four people who should be polling here. Yeah, there we go. All right, everybody good? And let's see what we got. So Ooh. you got some results there? Yeah, let's see here. Wow, you all are each uniquely, wow. <laughs> I did not expect that. <laughs> That's remarkable. <laughs> I did not expect that. So, wow. Okay, so that, that's going to be a little challenging, but we're going to make sure that we, we land in everyone's wheelhouse. Um, so our size is completely varied from one to five employees, six to 10 and 21 to 30. Okay. So <laughs> I imagine the two larger ones have the 21 to 30 employees. Great. All right. And then next, how many years has your organization been in existence? 10 to 20 and more than 20. So we have only one that's fairly newer. Um, I might um, ask a little bit later 
if the newer one has the smaller budget. I don't want to assume that because the newer one could have the largest budget. It just depends on how you how you begin. And since COVID, hmm, two have grown, one has stayed the same, and one has shrunk. And even staying the same is a challenge because we've seen so many income uh, strains with new demands for increased salaries and uh, workforce flexibility. So we'll have an opportunity to explore those conversations or just put them on your note if you wanna discuss that during our open discussion. Uh, we will have additional activities, uh, including you know, a conversation that we will have together and I'll help facilitate that as needed. And um, we'll talk about our boards a little bit later as well. So um, I wanted to note, and again, it makes sense. Uh-oh. It makes sense that our priorities shift uh, with the size of our agencies. And so we have the smaller agencies um, and you and we have our, our medium sized agency and then we have our two larger ones. And so I ask, you know, uh, whose pet project is your agency? And, and I'm saying that because and I want to be very clear what I'm talking about. Sometimes our smaller agencies have had a champion that ensures that they are always getting their funding that they can stand uh, on, that they can stand and depend on, on these resources. But what I wanted to note was a recent article that was in a Hillsborough newspaper just, just last week, um, where the uh, county was exploring these nonprofits and asking, why do we have all of these nonprofits on our county, um, on our county uh, budget? And should we be funding all of these nonprofit organizations every year with the same money without ever asking questions? Did any of you see that article? Okay, uh, 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 Fran said yes. And it's raised the question where all of a sudden organizations uh, that, that large and small that were dependent on county funding um, in some, some instances uh, $50,000 or more in other instances, a little bit less, but they've been dependent on this money for years. And now the question is, do we want to continue to fund this? And I'm not convinced that we should. So what hoops should we make these organizations jump through, number one, to find out how they're even using the money? And this is something, something new. Because as we are dealing with declining resources, so are the counties. And you're yeah, hearing- Can, can yes. I ask you something? I, I haven't seen that article. And, and I've heard some nonsense like that over the last 35 years. But it, it's really twofold. One, I've never had a government program give us anything without a multitude of questions, paperwork, documentation. Mm. So whoever's being quoted, either is totally clueless about the reporting <laughs> requirements for the nonprofits they've been funding, or there's something very different going on in that area that, that the rest of us have never been exposed to. The, the, the other part is, I, I, I don't know how many times I've heard sort of on the more conservative side, folks go, well, you know what, these nonprofits, you know, maybe we could get the for-profit sector to do it instead. And I actually mm. saw that with OAA money years ago. Well, they said, well, let's just put this out for bid and let for-profit companies do it. And then we said, well, then let's please make sure that, one, everybody agrees on the unfunded mandates that we all do. And right. second, let's define the pay scale for the employees who are doing this work, at which point the for-profit folks went away because they're not stupid enough to do some of the things that we all take on and do because we're mission-based. You know, I recall Walmart getting into the behavioral health business yeah. and I was shocked. You know, why would Walmart get into the behavioral health business? But, you know, there was obviously resources uh, to be made there, but the, but they weren't held to the same standard necessarily 
uh, that nonprofits, you know, it, it's a different, different mindset. So when you're smaller, you know, you're looking at it, questions of capacity um, and we all have capacity issues. You'll see that across the board. Um, sometimes, you know, we're looking at survival board sustainability. So a little bit later, you know, we'll have those, those conversations. Also benefits and staff, because if you're um, a half million dollars or less, those resources are harder to come by. And you're thinking about how do you how do you grow a little bit in order to have more resources? And then we look at our medium sized agencies and we're asking the same questions about capacity, but we start shifting more to technology and finance and, um, you know, hiring up. And I say hire up, you know, meaning, you know, who are we hiring? You know, I, I like to hire up. So when we have vacancies uh, because we're looking at growth. Um, I often will look to hire people that I hope uh, have a lot more going on than me in areas, especially in areas where I am lacking. So I'm always looking to hire people that I think are smarter than me um, because I want all of those folks to help us grow. And they do. And sometimes, um, sometimes, you know, we, when we're at the top, you know, it's a little uh, more challenging uh, with with organizations who, you know, may be um, not necessarily wanting to hire someone because, you know, you have rumors like, oh, they want your job or, um, but the truth of the matter is when we hire up, um, our agencies are all better uh, because of that and we grow. Um, you're also probably dealing more, beginning to deal more with legal issues for your medium-sized organization. I know it's certainly an issue for our larger organizations. Um, and you're probably in that space as a middle organization, you know, just looking for wiggle room. You know, um, you know, do I have a, just a little extra resources that I can put toward this? And do I have a little extra resources to put toward that? With our larger organizations, generally, many times the wiggle room, you've got a little bit more wiggle room, which helped, um, which may have helped you uh, certainly get through COVID um, because you have some flexibility and staffing and how you might utilize your workforce. These are just generalizations. They certainly don't apply to every organization of every size, but they're general enough uh, just so that you can kind of see the point being that um, different size organizations are dealing with different issues. Um, now, I would love to hear just just a quick two couple of comments if there's something different that you're struggling with um, based on your size, whether you're small on the left or large on the right and medium in the middle. What are the pressures right now? I think one thing I've seen over the years with nonprofits that become more successful is local government, rather than saying, you're doing a great job, we need you to expand more, go, well, why should we fund you? Mm -hmm. If you can do it, with, if you can do that much, why do you need us? And at the point, it's like, I, I keep coming back to, because we do work you don't want to deal with. And you don't yeah. want these people in crisis on your doorstep. But it, it's, I mean, I've seen that the Council on Aging here had a really innovative leader for years. And she did stuff with them that nobody had ever done before. And, and at one point, the county social services were going, well, why should we provide them funding? And I'm going, because they're doing more. Why limit it? Let them grow, you know. But it, it, two thirds of it is these local government people I deal with have never run a business in their entire lives. So they have no concept with what it costs all of us. Yeah. You know, just, just the fact, I mean, we, we're a nonprofit that does affordable housing, most, and, and we're a construction company. I, I've never run into folks who said, well, we're a small contractor too, but we pay $30,000 a year to have someone look at our books and tell everybody that they're okay. But we have right. to. That's exactly correct. Fran, did you have anything to add? You're on mute. All I can say is yes, yes, yes um, to everything Bill said. Um, 
it's it it can be extremely um difficult but you add on top of that that we're we're very dependent on um beyond the local governments we're also dependent on you know foundation or um you know institutional support and during covid after covid a lot of their priorities changed mm -hmm. and without any warning without any um and organizations that we had received funding from for years um no longer supported affordable housing or um in any form and they shifted their priorities over to homelessness and um food security wholeheartedly agree absolutely okay. you know, mm -hmm. but it didn't need to be an either or it could have right. been an and instead the and, housing first model yeah so um it was a it, that was a tough uh the, the, those were tough discussions to have and you know it was really hard on our um budget thank you fran so i wanted us to take a look uh, at these two definitions of community development one out of india and one uh from um from um a website so Number one, I underlined what the focus is. So if you look in India, and they kind of are the same, but there's a lot going on in these definitions of community development. And certainly, um, whether it's you know uh, promoting democracy, environmental sustainability, uh, it's a little feels a little different uh, there in India the way they define it. But when you think about social equality and organizing and educating and empowering people and fairness and access to jobs, you know, you look at us, quality of life, which could be access to jobs, um, education, all of those things. It's this huge collective effort um, to have uh, stable communities, which housing, of course, is key to and community development. And I'm, I wanted to know and just paint the question, are we trying to do all of these things in our organizations? Number one, are we mandated to do all of these things? Or are we choosing to do some of these things or all of these things? Or are we really focused on, on just one thing or two things that's core to our mission? Most of the time in nonprofits, we find ourselves, you know, trying to do all of these things. And you certainly, you know, there's room in this, in this area of community development, housing development, um, ensuring, you know, uh, that people uh, have places to live, sustainable neighborhoods. It makes sense that we're doing all of these things, but do we have the resources to do all of these things? No. <laughs> I mean, but no. we all, you know, but but and and uh, you know, I think the housing partnership is an example. Um, I mean, we we all see the need to help somebody. You, you've got to look holistically at it, and so you can't really look at someone and go, you know. And I had a board member who was a psychiatrist. He said, Billy says. I can use medication, I can use therapy, and I can send them home and they're feeling pretty good until they get to the house and it's raining on their bed. Mm. He said, all my work goes out the window. I, I've tried that the housing partnership sort of has three programs. We do, we create and build rental housing, we build first time home buyer homes, and we run a home repair program. And in all of it, I've said as much as I'd like to deal holistically with our clients, we can't find the resources to do credit counseling for every single one, much less do the social service. So I'm always saying, especially with our renters, I just want to be a decent landlord, but somebody needs to provide case management for this person. And, and then what you end up dealing with is, is all nonprofits, depending on their fund source, has some kind of a prioritized list, even within housing. Weatherization says you have to use high energy bills first the ship program says first come first serve someone else may 
and and when you sit there and try and say, how do I put all these pieces together? You have to mm -hmm. violate somebody's priority list. And we've gotten written up before because, well, we didn't stick to the priority list. But the same family got all the help we could offer them at one time. It made more sense. It was more efficient. It was more productive. But I was told, well, you shouldn't have helped them until after you got through the asset. But I had this money and it made more sense. Everybody's got their money in silos. And it's really mm -hmm. hard to get anybody to think outside of that, especially the smaller agencies are much more susceptible to being afraid someone else might take over if I say I can't do that or if I shouldn't do yeah. this. But it's it's the game we all play. And, and the worst part of it is that we never get a contract that's more than good for 12 months. No, Nobody in America runs a business with a business plan that is only 12 months long. But every single contract I've ever seen doesn't guarantee us work past really 60 days. You know, and that's pretty shocking. Uh, that is one of the things I've seen in Florida, the one-year contracts that I, I didn't see in other areas. Typically, I see two to three year and certainly five years on the federal front. So the one-year contracts um, in Florida is is a challenge. And I think, you know, that's that's part of this where we where we have to get when we get into this space where we'll be talking about partnerships is if if you're trying to do all of these things um, and you don't have the resources to do them all, um, you really have to begin to ask yourself, where should your focus be? Even though you, you know, individuals may have gotten accustomed to, to getting things that you provided in this space. Um, we have to make tough choices right now. And you have to ask yourself, do you have the resources to do all of these things? And the resources are not just the, the financial resources, but do you have the human resources uh, to do all of these things as well? I think Anita also has a question. Anita, please. I was just going to comment, and you all forgive me, but I'm on my phone that um, for us to answer that global question, we have to focus on one or two things to try to do it better. There is so much policy work, for instance, that's needed in each of these areas that we just don't have the depth and breadth in our organizations to undertake it as well as service delivery. And sometimes we're asked to cover larger customer pools or geographies than is practical, you know, especially with a smaller organization. And because no one wants to fund operating support, you know, trying to live from contract to contract or project to project for fees is a recipe for disaster. So we yeah. have to focus on one or two things and try to leverage our partnerships for other things. All of those things are important but they cannot be a priority for nonprofits, I think. Thank you, um, Anita, for sharing that. It's very important. Um, I feel like I'm, okay, finally I went. Let me see, I wanna make sure I didn't skip one. There we go. So we've um, had this question about what we're doing and what I wanted to do um, is, is give you all a moment. And I don't know if you uh, see your, um, your chat, button there to think about your work as we've been discussing your constituents your funders you know what are your top three annual outcomes and you may be doing a lot more than that um, and some of it you may be doing and you just haven't thought about doing but I'm asking you to really pull yourself into your organization and look at all that's going on, but what are your top three priorities? Let's see what's coming into the chat. Number of homes built and sold. educating renters on the home buying process. Frank. Tell 
अच्छा देखो जैसे number of homes rehabbed or rentals. Thank you, Fran. Bill. Okay, thank you for that. Um, those are there, and as you all can see from yourselves, there they overlap a lot. So there is a great deal of focus, but you may be doing other things outside of this. And I'm going to challenge you to look at all of those other things um, that you're doing or that you may be doing. Um, and you know, do yourself maybe that list down the middle of this is what we're mandated to do, and this is what I do because it it's a good thing to do, it's nice to do, it feels good to do. Um, but as we talk about resources, we're gonna have to think about how we we may um, have to wean ourselves from some of that because at some point, and I don't want to get too ahead of myself, um, but this advocacy piece is, is really strong and it also takes resources to advocate. So we're going to have to think about where we are putting um, those resources. Thank you for that. If I could just interject, Sandra. Yes, know, please. Get those. And you know, for us, it's, it's the number of people that we serve. You know, so I mean, we have a membership base and, you know, so we have people on this call and, you know, maybe on another call we have, you know, like the executive director and a couple of board members, you know, so we have to really keep track of the number of people that we're serving and, you know, and hopefully that they've learned something from that interaction. But some of those other things, and, and they are policy related, we don't do community organizing, but we do belong to nonprofit votes. So, mm -hmm. you know, you know, so so we're constantly sending things out to the members just, you know, like, hey, by the way, it's an election year. You know, if you're not working, you know, about get, and getting out the mm -hmm. vote, here's some resources, you know, so it's not something that we have to do. Got it. But it's and we don't obviously we don't get paid to do it, but it's something that we believe is organizationally we believe is important because how can you how can you. How can you build up a community if the community doesn't participate in their own future? You know, so encouraging our members to encourage their residents to participate in these kinds of activities is important. It's an important piece of what we do. Even yeah, though that's that's the core not, of civic. No, nobody, nobody gives us fifty thousand dollars a year to do that. Thank you for that. But then you also, you know, you may have, um, let's just say. Um, you have you have organizations like the United Way, for example, that puts on tax, tax, all of these tax, uh, uh, taxing, you know, tax preparation institutes is what I'm looking at this time of year, where people can go and get free help with tax assistance, and they have resources to do that. And this, you know, voting piece, yeah, that's the center, right, of civic engagement is ensuring that people know that they can and that they have a right. And that's the beginning, right, of the of the whole American dream is that right to vote, which leads to all of these other rights that we have. But I wonder also, as we think about these things, um, are there opportunities to, you know, to join and partner with organizations like the League of Women Voters, for example? Um, or other nonpartisan groups that you can say, here is our, here are our members and this is what we send them every year. Can you add them to your list to remind? I, I, I'm just kind of, yeah, you know, no, and, 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 and things. No, and absolutely that, and that's, and that's what we do. And I believe that that's what a lot of our members have to do as okay. Bill was saying to provide those wraparound services. You can't, you know, the goal obviously is, is, is to, you know, envelop the family in whatever services they need. But the reality is, is that we can't do it. And so if, if individual members, like, you know, we have partnerships like Nonprofit Vote, the Florida League of Women Voters, I don't mm -hmm. prepare any voting materials. I get them from those other entities and then I okay. share them with the members. 
So, you know, so I think it's, um, I wasn't being very clear, but I, and I think our members have to do the same thing, you know, you know, cause they're, they're like, Bill, Bill is, Bill's concern is to get the house and get the person in the house, but the person needs a lot more stuff. And so, you know, right. as a, as a, as, as a good community person, his organization says, we'll go here for this, or we'll bring a person in that can help you do that. So there's, there, there's a, a real need for our members to, to be aware of and to, and to utilize other other uh, resources within their communities. But you, thank you, know, you for that. Go ahead, Bill. When, when you talk to nonprofits about advocacy, especially related to anything to do with elected officials, people start to get very shy because they don't want the wrong person to be punitive if they get in. I, I had. <laughs> I had a job in 1982, I worked for a voter registration project and I ran a voter registration project in Ohio that registered people to vote who were on food stamp and unemployment lines. Totally, you know, had no interest. We were not at all talking about who was running for office. We just went and said, if these unemployment benefits are important to you, you need to, you need to be registered and you need to know who's gonna vote for you. My job was to go around and talk to nonprofit groups and get them involved in voter registration drives with the sense, if you give us time to register these people, we'll give you the list of all the folks that have been registered so you can use them for your own get out the vote and everything else. Mm. It was really tough. People were very, with, with the exception of groups like the legal women voters and other folks, in the nonprofit world, they were very reluctant, unless they had sort of a lobbying arm for their mm. region or national group. Yeah, the that small separation. Groups were very reluctant to do that because they felt it was going to come back and bite them in the butt. Yeah, that there's a fine line between that uh, lobbying and av and advocacy. And um, hold that thought, Bill, when we get to there, uh, because the, there there is it's a it's a fine line. But I find that we err too much on the side of conservatism and not advocating. And that's something that we, we can explore a little bit, too, in our advocacy discussion. So um, we've talked already a little bit about this, um, your unmeasured efforts. And I wanted you to think about a little bit more, um, take a moment and think a little bit more about uh, your work uh, some of it's already come out, uh, the advocacy part, like the get out the vote uh, for your constituents. What do you do for your boards? What do you have to do for your funders? Um, all of these things that are not necessarily measured, uh, but you have to get them done. So I would like for you, if you will, to take that same opportunity and type in the chat some things that your agency does resources that you spend toward non-mandatory things that don't significantly contribute to your primary measured outcomes. So take a moment to think about that. And then you can start building the chat. What are you doing? All of this stuff that you're not mandated to do, but you have to do, or you're doing it and nobody's measuring it. You know what you're doing, but you're not reporting on those measures anywhere. Hmm. Yes, Lord, Terry. Mm hmm. Definitely. Staff training and professional development. Research and outreach to find new funding opportunities, grant writing. Resources go to care and feeding of our board. Oh, <laughs> you're breaking my heart, Anita. Oh my God. Under research. Wow. 
wow. Raining for less than hood allows. Quite, quite getting quite a list of things here, aren't we? Yeah, this is this is very <laughs> insightful. I'm gonna give it another minute because it I'm it's shocking. <laughs> I could go on this all day. I'm going to mute myself. Wow. Strategic planning. So while that's building, because clearly there's some, there's some significant stuff here. So I want you all to take a look at this list, scroll up and down, see what you see. Qualifying buyers for homes. Ha, huh, yeah, current interest rates. Kissing many wrong. <laughs> I need the prize. So, let me hear um let me hear from Anita. Um and, and bef before you start, Anita, I want you to know you're in good company and there is hope because my board uh was self-described and it's a different board now. But when I was hired, they told the stories about being a cake eating board. And um, I want to talk a little bit about that. You know, we, all of these subjects are very intentional. We have discussions scheduled about board engagement, and we'll get more to this. But um, let me hear from each of you on what you're seeing and what you're, what what this is saying to you. Any thoughts? Wow. I can't, I can't <laughs> see if anyone is um oops, sorry. That's not what we're no, we're not break time yet. I'm trying to go back. There we are. Can can you unmute yourselves and let's have a conversation about this? Am, am I not hearing anybody? Go ahead, Fran. <laughs> um, the, you know, Bill said it before about the unfunded mandates and, and, you know, in some ways it does feel like we have all these uh, unfunded mandates because, um, you know, the perfect example is we have to do these exhaustive uh, audits every year, but it's not just the um, independent audits. Every three years, we have HUD that comes in and does an audit. Every three years, we have NeighborWorks that comes in and does an audit. The local jurisdictions ask, uh, one of them just came in and did an audit, you know, and it's incredibly time consuming, you know, with all of the re different reportings and all the different, um, you know, just information gathering in the different formats that each one wants to see it in, right? It's just, um, it's exhausting. And, um, but it's, it's a necessary evil that we have to live through as a nonprofit. And um, it, it's, we can't provide the service or meet our mission without the funding that is provided that comes along with all of these additional mandates. And um, I would love to find the secret sauce of how to fund all of that work so I can use the funds that I receive for the, you know, exclusively for the purpose that they were given to us. But, in, you know, I have to do all this. I have a full-time staff person. We're a tiny agency, but I have to have a full-time staff person that does nothing but billing and reporting. And it is a full-time job. Hmm. It's not an entry-level job. 
You have to have somebody no, that actually not. knows what they're doing to do that work. Well, you know, and, and we brought up earlier the impact since COVID with paying people a fair way. Oh, yeah. N nonprofits have a terrible reputation of saying, I've got great people who work and they work for less than anybody else around. And and I and I've I've had directors say that proudly, and I look at them and I go, so those people have no future. They're working themselves into the ground. They will fall apart at some point. But you know, and and thinking when I go to foundations, with um, I think Terry and I were at a meeting with the Jacksonville Community Foundation, some folks about a year ago, and I was talking to one of them, and I said, look. I said, if we haven't learned anything from COVID, we found out that most employees are essential because you don't want to do their job. And in the nonprofit world, if we lose somebody who's learned how to network, whether it's your front desk receptionist or anybody else, but they know they can call Terry about this and they can call Frank about that, to train somebody, if that person leaves because they need $2 more an hour, you're toast for six months. Yes. And and when we go to, when we go to the foundations and say, look, we've got to raise our rates. I mean, I, I two years ago I moved everybody here above twenty bucks an hour, and that was just Good to keep you. up with rent in the area. But I also told them, I said that means if there's level funding for us, we're going to do fewer units. I'm not promising you I'm going to do more with less. I'm going to tell you that. I'm retaining good quality people who will bring a level of service that we need. But, you know, I feel That's for some outrageous. foundations because they have to wrap their heads around if we give somebody more money or we give them the same amount of money, but they're paying their people better, they're more stable, they're more resilient, but th their chances are very good that for a year or two, they're not going to increase their service units. And so much yeah. of this just counting beans in a jar. Yeah, you're absolutely right. And I, I want to, uh, you know, give you kudos for courageous leadership and and giving your staff a raise and recognizing that, yeah, it's going to come from somewhere, but we have to do those things. And it takes it takes courage to do it, because on the other hand, it's like, well, you know, we want you to do more. But then we have to get you have to get into the advocacy space and the board plays a big role in that as well. And so. Yeah. um Thank you all for sharing your insights. Was there anyone else's hand up? Because I can't see from my view. I don't see any. Okay. So this brings us to, okay, a two minute break. <laughs> You're like two minutes. So take, turn off your camera, take a, take a two minute break. <laughs> I'm going to go and heat up a cup of tea. I'll be that right. That sounds back. good. Thank you all. all right.
All right. We'll have everyone start coming back. That was a quick two minutes. <laughs> Amazing how fast it goes, isn't it? It really is. Hopefully everyone is back. I see Bill. Um, I'm going to assume, uh, even though the cameras are off, we're going to go on and move into our next session because I do want to make sure that we stay on time. This next series will go a little bit faster than the first series, which was a lot of sort of information gathering. Uh, here we go. So let me get back to sharing. So let's um, let's look at this. Uh, we talked a little bit about strategic planning, and I want us to talk uh, a bit about the board and where we are. Some of the decisions that we may need to make, but I wanted to also clarify that whether you have a, a, an engaged board whether you have a cake eating board like mine used to be, or whether you have you know, a board that is unresponsive, these, some of these things are these decisions that we are faced with as nonprofits um, in this competitive space, in this limited resource space, these are board decisions and they are board strategic decisions. And if your board uh, is not engaged in making these decisions, then it's up to us executive directors to have the courage to guide our board. And sometimes, you know, we think, oh, you know, but, you know, they're my boss and I can't tell them what to do, but they are absolutely responsible. Um, and they bear responsibility for any major problem that your organization has. So, so it's best to, if you haven't been in the business of really letting them know what your needs are and that they need to engage. Um, and we can talk about how to make some shifts there if you need to uh, begin shifting your board. Um, this is their responsibility and, and they are held responsible. Um, that's why their name is on, that's why their name is on the organization's uh, documents as far as, you know, the uh, the authoritative party uh, with fiduciary responsibility. So we've asked you how many of you have grown and, and two have grown, one has stayed the same and one has shrank. So um, I want you to think about, you know, if you're staying the course, you know, this is a decision where we are right now. You're either going to stay the course, you're either going to, you know, grow or you're going to, you know, die on the vine, so to speak. So, but whatever happens, these are board decisions. So you have to think about how much is needed and increase resources to stay the same. If you have not figured that out, or if you have not began to put a uh, pen to paper, um, especially if you shrank, how much have you shrank? You can start with that number. You know, if you were 1.5 million and now you're 1.2 million, then you're already $300,000 uh, less in size and scope and capacity than you used to be. And then you add amount of amount, an amount of inflation to that And so just to stay the same, you know, you're looking at whatever that inflationary number is and it's highest, higher here in Florida than anywhere else, plus the 300,000 that you shrank. That's a real number and those are real costs. And these are conversations that you need to have with your board if you aren't having them uh, to talk about where the agency is going. Um, will a line of credit get you through? this tough operations, you know, or this temporary rough patch. Is it temporary? Or is it really something that you see can't be turned around? Are you struggling with employees 
who are nearing retirement? Are you yourself nearing retirement? And you have ch these challenges that are going to be passed on to the next executive director who are your partners? Are there new competitors? Are there new housing organizations that have popped up? Who's depending on you? Are you meeting their current needs? And if not, what is it gonna to take to do so? That's a lot of questions. And again, right now, this is just to get your, your, your thoughts going because you're gonna get these slides and this, is, this should be your guide, guide post of where you're going to begin to lay out a strategic discussion for you and your board. So that's the discussion on staying the course. Then we have the other option, is it time to grow? How do you know that it's time to grow? Some of you are growing, but you didn't necessarily plan to grow. You just happened to grow um, because you know, of, of opportunities that, that came about. So um, are we leveraging, you know, can you let, do you have resources to leverage? Do you have relationships? Do you have resources to invest? And, you know, you may say, no, I don't have any resources to invest. Well, maybe you do have resources to invest. Perhaps you have resources to invest if you're spending resources that are not measured in some area, because that's real money. And sometimes you have to ask yourself, is this the best place for this money or is it time for me to invest? We had a, a program that was losing anywhere from two to $400,000 a year. We're a pretty big agency. And our seven lines of business are almost like smaller nonprofits. And the programs in some cases themselves can be their own nonprofit. In this case, it was losing two to $400,000 a year. And without getting into all the details of this, I'm happy to have conversations with you all. After the fact, I'll share my, my email and contact information. But the, the gist of it is that when we, we, me and the board, when we had a discussion and after years of giving it the opportunity because we gave it a timeline. If it's not going to work, we're going to cut our losses because you can, when you're losing two to $400,000, but that's two to $400,000. That's real money. That if I don't have this program, I can invest that somewhere else. So when we closed that program, we began to grow. And in four years, we've almost doubled our size. That's unheard of, but it started with that very challenging, difficult decision to stop doing something that was never going to cover its costs and shifting those resources to do something else. Larger agencies, is there an opportunity to acquire a smaller organization? Um, is there a legislative sponsor itching to make a name or a legacy for themselves? This goes to that advocacy piece. You know, we have legislatures who who will who um, will invest in a program because they want their name on it. They want a legacy. They want something to leave behind. And we have several of those, and I can talk to you about those also. We don't have time to go through all of that today. But there are legislators out there who want to make a name for themselves and would love to do that by naming something, you know, or other, some something that you're doing to do that. Um, um, Terry, I'm going to ask if you see any um, any uh, chat things that I should answer to let me know because I'm looking at oh, a no, viewer. You, yeah, you can't that. see that. You're not. Uh, no, I don't have anything in chat. OK, I see there. There's nothing there yet. Great. Um. And then also, if you're larger and you've been around, you have a trusted, stable, known leader, you know, these are all opportunities to grow because, because you've made a name for yourself and people know and trust you. And are there tilo, silos that we have? Someone mentioned funding silos. Uh, but even within our smaller organizations, our focused organizations, there can be silos where we can maybe maybe rethink some things uh, for greater impact. 
And then the other option, is it time to fold? And this is a tough question. Nobody wants to hear this. I know this, but you have to ask yourself, is it time to fold or is it time to be acquired? And what does that look like? You have an unsustainable board of directors. You cannot do this alone. It's not your responsibility, executive directors, to do this alone. You must have board partners who are in the process of leading with you, partnering with you, guiding the strategic direction of the agency, not just showing up to eat cake and salad. And have you been spent, have you spent three to five years trying to survive, trying to grow, but unsuccessfully? Is there over-reliance on a founding funder? Someone who said, we need this organization. We need an organization to help find housing for uh, people in the community who need affordable housing. We can do this. We can build housing. We can maintain it. And that person is so committed and has been committed and has supported financially. But now they're like, I can't do this anymore. I'm of age. I'm on a fixed income. I need to retire. Are you having difficulty attracting additional funding beyond that one source? Can your clients receive services through another organization? This is that question that we're asking ourselves you know, is there another housing corporation? Is there another community development organization that if we closed our doors and was acquired by another organization, they would continue to be served? I know for our housing, I get emails and calls every week with somebody wanting to buy it. It's like, no, we're not for sale. <laughs> but those, those people are out there. Have you had three to four years of significant budget deficits? And I'm saying significant. And is there an ongoing increased inability to keep up with the increasing costs? So I put a lot on your mind there. I want to give you a moment to ask questions or just to comment, um, you know, quickly if there's something in these three slides I'll go back, whether you're trying to grow, whether you're just gonna stay the course and how do you determine what you really need to operate and how do you begin to document that? Or are you looking at that it's time to be acquired? Any thoughts from anyone? <laughs> I'm looking at these three um, three slides, and I have to admit that I've had the opportunity to see them before, and um, and I think that these are great, um, really, really well put together, serious questions for every organization. You need to do a, a, a board meeting that you just talk about where you are on this spectrum, and once you identify it, go through those questions, I think. I think that these would be an enormous help to any organization, no matter where they are. Thank you, Terry. You're absolutely right. But this is a board discussion. These are board led strategic decisions that you as leaders bring to the board and say, it's time for us to look at where we are and what we're doing and have a strategy. So that brings us to advocacy. You know, we talked about, um, you know, relationship with elected officials, but that could be a host of things that you are doing to get your story out there um, to, you know, you, you, you may have that, you may have in a, in a sea, you know, in a sea of, you know, horses, you've got a zebra, right? That board member who's invested in your agency uh, who also supports political candidates, maybe. Maybe you have a board member of means 
And if they are, they usually are supporting po political candidates. So they have a voice with our elected officials and they can meet with those individuals with you and say, you know, this is what we need. This is what, this is what we need. And when you have an advocate like that, honestly, um, the sky is the limit. And if you're not using your board members or you don't know who they're connected to, um, or, you know, if they are financially heavily, uh, um, invested in candidates, it's worth your knowing. It's worth your knowing because things get done in Tallahassee because of donors, many of who are, if they're not serving on a board, they may be one of your donors. They may be one of your donors who are also giving to these politicians and, and it's sitting down with them and telling them what you need. Um, and if we're not doing that again, these are opportunities. These are, these are times where we have to think outside the box and look at resources around every corner. And that resource could be a donor who supports a politician. Could be one of your board members who's not really engaged, but as a leader, we have not really gotten into their head to see what makes them tick. Letters to the editor of local newspapers. I love writing to the newspaper. I've only done it once or twice since in, being in Florida. But when I was in Texas, every month I had an article in the newspaper that talked about some aspect of what our work was. And it, it gains interest and it gains friends. And in some cases it was refu refuting other craziness out there from people who, you know, make claims about things that are rooted in stupidity. <laughs> and you just have to, you just have to say, that's not really the way it works. And you can't be afraid to do this. You know, this is not a time for fear. You know, we have to, uh, we have to uh, learn to advocate and this advocacy thing could be a whole workshop in and of itself. But uh, these slides again, you will you will get. Sorry. Um, I also want to encourage you to look at the resources. I, you know, many times we're a member of organizations, but we don't spend a lot of time on their website. And I spent some time on the um, alliances website. And I really think there are some incredible resources there. And I went down wormholes to see what other training is connected, what other educational, what other resources, grant things are there. I hope you're using that. If you've not visited their website for a while, I want to encourage you to do that. Uh, oh, no. Oh, that's Rob signing off. Okay. He can he can sign off. <laughs> Thank you, Rob. <laughs> <laughs> all right um i I'd, li I'd like to just point out too you know thank you thank you for yes. that sandra we we really vivian and i spend a lot of time on the website but uh, i also encourage you to visit the nasita website because they they've been doing um with the urban institute and some other partners they've been publishing some um studies of our field that haven't been done in over 20, 25 years. So this is new data that that they're turning up. And it's all about, you know, the, the financial operations of nonprofits, um, you know, who they're serving, how they're serving them, where their money is coming from, the size of the organizations, the number of, you know, I mean, there's some really good, really good stuff there. And then the other place that I would refer you is to the Florida Nonprofit Alliance. They serve all kinds of nonprofits, not just not just us, you know, community based development organizations, um, but they also have a lot of resources and they do a great deal of public policy. That is one of their primary functions. And so when when you get when you get our newsletter and you see policy stuff in there, that's coming off very often from the Florida Nonprofit Alliance, um, because they, they do, in fact, have the resources to um, as part of a national network of the National Nonprofit Alliance Network. Um, so, so they track both state and federal policy. So um, if you don't, you know, I mean, I, I try and make sure that you get this information, but you know, what 
in that 10 minutes that you have every day that where you do nothing, mm -hmm. go and explore somebody else's website. You might be, you might be surprised and amazed at some of the stuff you can find. These are also opportunities with these reports. Uh, thank you, Terry. Uh, especially the ones that she was mentioning with Naseda. These are opportunities for board education. Your board needs to know this stuff. And so, so pulling down a report, putting together a little short presentation and saying, hey, members of the board, we're gonna do something a little different this month or this quarter, depending on how often you meet. They want to give you an updated look at the sector and what we're doing. Educate them. They need to know. And then that lays the foundation for all these other conversations um, that you need to have. So let's look at board engagement and resource and resource development. Let's uh we're gonna launch our um launch our next poll. So this poll has five questions. So Don't forget to scroll, to scroll down. down again. Yes. You know, how often does your board meet? Or are they involved in fundraising? Or are they involved in advocacy? Is your board aware of your financial challenges? Really? How transparent are you with your board regarding your future fiscal outlook? And you've got three answers there, three options. And we're not going to call anybody out on these. These are anonymous. They are so anonymous. Please be, be honest with yourself because this is going to help us. It's going to help you. It's going to help your colleagues. I don't think Anita can play because she's um, driving, but it looks like everybody has participated. So I'm going to go ahead and end this. All righty. And I'm going to share the results. So what have you got, Sandra? Okay. I've got how often does the board meet monthly? 67%. So most are meeting monthly and um, one is meeting quarterly. So that, um, says to me that there is, for most of you, sufficient time and engaged opportunity to engage the board in some of these bigger questions and discussions. Is your board involved in fundraising 100% <laughs> no? Okay. No surprise there. <laughs> so that's an opportunity. That's a huge opportunity. How do we get our board involved in fundraising? They absolutely should be. And that, you know, and, and, and I know it's housing, but all this other stuff that you're doing, that's not mandatory, but that you need to do, you know, how do we get them to vote? How do we get them educated? How do we, you know, do these other things to have our, have our residents have community fundraising absolutely undergirds those things. And there's a whole population of folks who do want to get involved and who want to help raise money. But it may be, again, I should have asked, is your board term limited? Because I found on housing boards that they rarely turn over. And that's a challenge. Because um, you don't have enough time to go out and recruit more people or do it well. And some, I mean, I'll admit, I'm intimidated trying to build a more functioning board. I've, I've always sort of had a perspective. There's three kinds of boards. There's one that goes out and helps you fundraise, you know, meet all the fiduciary requirements. There's one that wants to know why you bought six boxes of pencils when you only needed three this month. And then there's another one that pats you on the back and say, go forth, do good things. Please don't bother us. And I've kind of always tended towards the third one just because it lets me do things more on my own. But it's, it's, <laughs> After 25 years, it's not a great track record. It really is not because and, at some point you're going to retire, Bill, and that oh yeah. board is not going to be ready well, to hire my your staff. replacement. My staff, no one wants my job. Well, <laughs> See, we I, need to no, talk. <laughs> it's, it's, you know, it's, I brought it up with the board before. About five years ago, I had a little bout with cancer and it's all gone, all got cleared up and stuff. But it made them sit down and say, so what if Bill gets hit by a truck? 
And my board president says, well, you need a second, someone who can work right there with you, learn the whole. And I said, that's really nice. I said, I got to figure out where the money comes to hire a second. And I've got to have enough money to hire someone who really is going to take seriously what we do. It can't be like an entry level position. Hmm. And, and so we've been sort of stuck in that little circle of what do we do? And I, I have stayed away from fundraisers. I don't want to do golf tournaments. I don't want to do car washes or cooks, bake sales or marathons or anything like that. Because every time I see nonprofits doing it, it sucks in their staff time. Yeah. And, doing it. And, and I've got to sit there and say, mo we, we are so sort of lean on the admin side that if I pull somebody away from doing something, they were doing a job that brought money in or qualified someone to bring money in. And, you know, if I make $20,000 on a golf tournament, that's not a heck of a lot if I lose somebody for 30 or 40 hours over a two month period. Going to, um, you're right. Uh, I am, and there are costs to fundraising, but, and we're not going to get into that here. That's a whole nother conversation. It's just, you know, the board should be involved at some level of helping to raise money to fill gaps and to help the agency become innovative. And these are conversations that you have to ask yourself and, and you can't you can't be comfortable with them just letting you do your thing. I know it's comfortable now because you've been doing it for 25 years, but your organization is going to be in, in trouble, Bill, when you leave and mm -hmm. the board um, and you may end up forcing the organization into a state of, you know, folding because the board doesn't want to do the work because they haven't really been. Well, it's, it's, you know, we, we ran, we just went through like a big overview of what we did with a company that does sort of overviews of construction companies. And, and ultimately, you know, we came out with, it's a simplistic analysis, but our, our success rate is inversely proportionate to our profit and loss. We build uh, Bill, I'm going to I'm going to oh. stop you because we oh, really yeah. are. We're only about 10 minutes left. Oh, and I okay. and I and I feel like I, we're not going to have the time to discuss and we won't need it because we've been discussing all along. But I do want to get through the rest of the slides for you all. Um, and then, um, Terry, I'll be happy to get with you if we need to do another 30 minute debrief at some time with this group. I'm happy to to just do that. OK, because I realize this was a lot to bite off. Um, the it last a, it's a big agenda. <laughs> now, the last couple of questions, is your board aware of the financial challenges? All of you said yes. Thank you for that. And the, the board very regularly knows uh, um, your fiscal outlook. So that's good too. Thank you for that. Okay, I have to get back here. Um, and then um, someone said that you haven't had rate increases. This is really um, something that you have to do. I know that it's a difficult time to talk about rate increases, but your organizations are partly funded, you know, by, you know, the cost that you get to run the organizations and what comes in off of the rate, off of the, um, off of the rental rates. And you can make the case because your rates haven't increased in so long. Um, that it's time for a, rent, rent, a rate increase. And you don't have to go all the way, right? But you can go part of the way and begin that process. We had to do the same thing recently and it made a huge difference. We were losing resources on our housing um, and we finally said, you know, we can't make this work and we can't do the maintenance and we can't do all these other things that we need to do if we're not, you know, charging the right price. And so yeah, I'm just going to encourage you all to do that. Um, I'm not going to go into this deeply. I just want you to know that if you want to consider, if it's time for you to consider being a part of another organization, a merger is basically where two nonprofits come together and they create something new. Whereas an acquisition is, the one acquiring keeps its identity, scoops up the, the other one. The other one loses its 501c3 and becomes a part of the lar larger organization. And um, we did that with an organization just a couple of months ago. Um, I've got a few more minutes and I want to share uh, what this looks like. 
if you all are thinking that you want to be acquired, it's not an easy sort of like, oh, let's we love each other, let's just get together. I want to show you a roadmap to what this um, looks like. And um, I'm going to pull it up very quickly. So our organization acquired a smaller nonprofit um, back in 2020, right during COVID. Um, and we began this, well, actually we started meeting about it in 2019. And as you can see here, you know, we had discussions with the boards. We talked about what it looked like. We studied, you know, the website. We built an initial budget. What would it cost for us to run that organization? Um, we went into, uh, we had conference calls with their board and our board. Uh, we had all kinds of, you know, Zoom meetings. Then we had the COVID thing that jumped in. Then we had our strategic planning committee review our plan to acquire these organizations. We, um, you know, had joint board meetings of their board and our board. Then our board gave us the okay that we could go through phase one of acquisition. And that's where we began to do our due diligence. We looked at our software and what software they use. Um, had our human resources uh, thing, look at their employees, et cetera, et cetera. You keep going down and we began to look at their funding and their banking relationships. And um, if you're if you have any interest in that, I can really honestly uh, have a conversation with you about all of this, but it goes on. It goes on. We had to look at transition of technology. Of course, we were a large organization. They were very small, less than a half a million dollars. Um, looked at their audits, made sure that the audits were clean. Uh, looked at the background checks for their employees before we could hire them on as our employees. Looked at... Um, you know, phase three, you know, and it goes on and on. Um, and eventually we transferred their assets and they lost um, and turned back in their 501c3. But that's that's a huge process. So it's not something to be taken lightly, right? Um, but it is something to be considered because it does happen. Um, I have, I think, just a couple of more slides. And I want to share those with you. Are you still here? Yes, I'm not here. We're we're, we're all we're all still here. Uh, sure. I did have the opportunity to go over that list that uh, Sandra just shared with you um, in some detail, and it is wow! It is exhaustively precise. We worked with a consultant when we were considering. Um, merging with another organization. And it was a six page list um, where, you know, and that was just the due diligence, you know, going through the dil due diligence phase. And it was a good thing it was at that exhaustive. So we didn't make the mistake of going down that path. Yes, that's the whole point. You don't want to spend that kind of time and energy and then have it be a bad scenario. Last on, on here is innovation. And this is basically taking little ideas um, that, that shift. It's not some big, huge thing. You know, we think about innovation and it's like, oh, I have to create a new organization. Oh, I have to completely do something that's technology-based. Innovation is really just taking little things, little steps um, that will improve a process or something that you offer. And so I want to encourage you to think about um you know, where, uh, where you have low hanging fruit, where do you have ideas that will improve your goods and services? Hey, in this case, if you haven't had a rent increase in five years, six years, 10 years, that's low hanging fruit. And that would be pretty innovative. And you may be surprised what comes out of that in the way of additional capacity to operate. Um, I'm so sorry. I feel like I just rushed through that innovation. Uh -oh. I'm so sorry, Terry. I feel like I did a terrible job. You know, no, no. It's just the whole point of this was not just to present information, but to give people an opportunity to share 
you know, their concerns and what they're going through. And so, you know, you know, folks, you're, you're going to get the presentation, you're going to get a recording. I am using artificial intelligence, which is going to summarize the meeting for us, which I will review and see if it's actually any good. Um, <laughs> um, but no, you know, Sandra, please don't, don't be concerned. It's, it's a, it's a lot of stuff to cover and there was a lot of good conversation around it. So um, what I would like to do is to launch a final a closing survey. And while I'm, uh, while I launch that, um, there's just three or four questions there, um, five actually. So um, take a minute and please complete that for me. But if you've got any last, last questions for, for Sandra, uh, this is, a, we've got a couple of minutes left. So And Terry, if there is a specific area, just a, a conversation that anyone wants to have about any particular area that may have come up, um, please share my information. I'm happy to have that conversation. Okay. That's very gracious of you. Thank you, Sandra. I know you're <laughs> I know you're really, really busy. Terry and Sandra, thank you both for putting this together. Uh, I mean, it's, it's perfect for me. Excellent, right, excellent. It's it's um if if you were at the summit uh, last year, Sandra did a, a, a similar a similar session at the summit, and it was just so well received. And this is just it's such an enormous issue for for us as the alliance, as well as for our members. And you know, and this is not something that we can just sweep under the rug and pretend isn't happening. I was I was happy to see that everybody is telling their board the true financial story. Yes. That, makes me feel good. <laughs> me too. Me too, Terry. It's so easy to hide things. So. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, thank you all for your patience and your time today. Um, I realize I, I can be very ambitious <laughs> in thinking about the agenda, but um, I'll, I'll make adjustments for